Uh, I think uh, we are uh, ready to go and start our webinar session. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Siarana Deka, and I work for uh, Foundation for Ecological Security, and I currently based in uh, Guwahati. Uh, once again, uh, on behalf of APS and our partner organizations, I'd like to welcome you again uh, to this uh, webinar sessions. Uh, uh, this session is actually the part of our ongoing uh, World uh, Common Celebration. As you know, uh, APA, uh, along with our local communities, uh, and our partner organization has been celebrating the uh, World uh, Common Week uh, for last one week to spread uh, the message and uh, educate the masses about the significance and importance of commons in their lives. Uh, we have been doing a series of webinar sessions, uh, uh, a uh, lot of events uh, campaigning around the commons, uh, competition among the children, and also photography competition uh, to highlight the, the role that common play in our life. Uh, as you all know, in last uh, uh, webinar, uh, we have we had a very interesting uh, uh, session on the June cultivation, uh, June cultivation where, uh, where our distinguished uh, speaker uh, talked extensively on the June cultivation in Northeast India and also highlight uh, the dynamic and then issue that related to Zoom cultivation in Northeast India. Uh, in continuation with this, uh, uh, today we are uh, again bringing another interesting topic on land governance system in Northeast India, and uh, where we will be focusing on how uh, land governing system in Northeast India are influencing the common property resources uh, of, of these regions. Uh, just to give us a little bit uh, uh, the context of the, the land governance system, uh, as you all know, uh, in Northeast India, land is considered to be a, uh, considered to be a common property resources, but community rights of other of other land and its resources are given utmost importance than the, the individual rights, and this uh, this tradition actually built on the foundation of just sharing the common resources. Uh, this uh, co uh, this uh, common resources in uh, northeast india are uh, are, are found in diverse uh, landscapes uh, which include the uh, the community land for uh, uh, cultivations and the grazings the community forest for uh, collecting forest resources uh, the river the rivulet the habitation areas and the sacred groves and other communal uh, land by looking at the land governance system in Northeast India, as you all know, it is very unique in the same time, it is very complex in nature. And in order to understand, it requires uh, require very systematic deliberation to understand this complexity of land governance system in Northeast India. Uh, because of uh, uh, the land governance system is very between the uh, state, uh, regions, uh, the tribes, and even the villages actually. And this land governance system uh, actually built on the oldest traditions of land, land management and the governance and the ownership practices. But some of these, uh, uh, the traditional land governance, land governance system still practice some of the places in Northeast India. Uh, the village council, like you know, many of you heard about uh, the Gavura, those are the traditional institutions who actually are responsible for uh, the managing this uh, land governance system in Northeast India. And these uh, traditional institution and also the traditional practices actually uh, recognized and also protected under the uh, Indian constitution under the six schedules and also other uh, several uh, provision related to this state. Uh, land uh, in most part of the Northeast India actually broadly classified into three category. Uh, one is the, uh, the community lands where the, all the, the households and the community has equal rights and the, uh, equal right to access the resource and the, the lands. Then we have a, a clan a land uh, where the particular clan members are only allowed to access the particular resources and also utilization of those particular land. And at the same time, we have an individual land where an uh, individual uh, household has a access right to those uh, resources. Uh, despite this uniqueness uh, and then constitution protection, over decade we have seen uh, there is a, a trend in changing land governance systems. Uh, there is a monetization and privatization of community lands. Uh, and besides, uh, the community lands are under serious threat from uh, ongoing the mining activity, infrastructure project, uh, communal tension, and conflict over lands, uh, land acquisition by the 
the government and the private enterprises and those actually the posing serious threat uh, to the community land or also the common property resources uh, so i'll not talk much about the the uh, the land governance system uh, uh, now uh, as our distinguished speaker are uh, going to talk uh, about it in depth uh, so in order to understand that this complexity uh, of the land governance system uh, the past and the present uh, uh, today we have uh, uh, invited uh, one of the most uh, distinguished and reputed uh, researcher and also an activist uh, from the region, uh, Dr. Walter Fandendes, sir, who spent his uh, life uh, in uh, to understand that the, the dynamic of the land governance systems and also the common property uh, resources in Northeast India. Yeah, so, go for it. so, but then so let me. Yeah, let me introduce uh, Sir uh, uh, Fernandez. Uh, so he he has been a pioneering in researching on tribal and gender issues, no, displacement and livelihood in Central and Northeast India. How do I? And do? his work has been highly valued and also quoted by many uh, national, international, even the government uh, when it's come when it's come and talk about the Northeast India. Uh, he was also a director of uh, India Social Institute, New Delhi. Uh, in the same time, he published uh, numerous books and essays on land governance, uh, displacements, livelihood, and also served as the editor of the Journal of Social Action. Uh, mm -hmm. Side by side. Mm -hmm. Dr. Walter is also a founder and director of uh, Northeastern uh, Social Research Center, which is based in Guwahati. And this organization uh, mostly uh, uh, and closely work with uh, activist groups and the other people working on those social issues. Uh, with this note, I'd like to welcome and also thanks uh, uh, Dr. Fernandez sir uh, for taking uh, his time for this webinar uh, from his busy schedule. And we all hope he, uh, from this webinar will be uh, benefiting. Uh, now I'll give time to uh, Dr. Uh, Walter Fernandez uh, to share his experiences and his knowledge on this vast and the complex nature of a land governance system in North East India. Now, uh, so can you hear me, sir? I can hear. Yeah. So but now I'm having uh, problems sharing the screen. Okay, just a minute, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Now you the co-host, sir. Now the the floor can and time is yours. How to go to the washroom? Can you see uh, see the? Uh, PowerPoint. Not yes, sir. Stop video, Gollum. Now, let me tell you. Hey, Baba, I'm going to take a look at the Just give me a few seconds, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. Now you're the co-host. You yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can see your presentation, sir. Please carry okay. on. Yeah. Okay, then I'll begin. Shall I? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry about this, some confusion here. Uh, this is the title given to me, Land Governance System. Uh, and thank you, Tapas, uh, Yaranjit, and others for this opportunity during this week. Now, uh, what I'll do is I'll go over the land laws in different states of the Northeast, and what are the implications for land alienation and for the commons in general. Sir, can you, uh, can you make the presentation in PowerPoint a slight mode? Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see your PowerPoint. So can yes, you put it that's in it. That's it, I'll do that. Now, uh, it's the laws 
are important in the sense that it can, they can, the, the changes can result in conflicts, land alienation and conflicts. Land is a major area of conflicts in the Northeast. Now, traditionally, land was managed under the uh, tribal customary law. Uh, it protects land from outsiders. But or during the last few de decades, the tendency has been to impose individual-based formal law on the uh, customary law. There is the new interface. Either the customary law is ignored or the two come face to face and that causes a great bit of confusion and also a, a much land alienation. Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, can I request one more time to put the presentation in the PowerPoint? Yes, 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 sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Is it yeah. okay? Yeah, yes, it's fine now, sir. Please yeah. go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Because the, the, there's problem with the electricity, it comes and goes, oh, and that causes some problem. Now it results in internal. There are two. Uh, another new phenomenon is internal land alienation. You have this whole combination of imposition of the customary uh, formal law over the uh, customary law without preparing the community for it. You have the second phenomenon of the interface where the two meet and the formal law dominates and there is confusion and much alienation. The third is not just external alienation but also internal alienation within the tribe. Now, the, that contradiction is the first step of conflicts and interface with the formal law causes more conflicts. Now, what are the laws? Every state has its own law. Nagaland and Mizoram are governed by Article 317A or 317G. G. In other words, they come under the formal, uh, the customary law. No central law is valid till it is recognized by the legislatures of these uh, states. For example, Nagaland never recognized the Land Acquisition Act. So all acquisition had to be through negotiations with the community. And that was very helpful less, fewer negative uh, results than uh, elsewhere. In Manipur, 60% of the population lives on 10% of the land, non-tribal population. The hills form 90% of the land and 40% of the population, but it does not have the sixth schedule. It says that it uh, the hill land comes under the special law, but that special law does not really protect their land. And that has been an ongoing source of conflicts. Meghalaya, all three major tribes, the Garo, the Kasi, and the, uh, this one, are all three major tribe are matrilineal, but patriarchal. And the whole state has uh, comes under the sixth schedule. In Arunachal Pradesh, there is 371H, which gives special powers to the governor. But there is no customary law protecting their land. It's only the land is run under the under customary practices. Tripura was a tribal majority state, but after the partition, uh, uh, the first they were the partition refugees, and fr from the 1950s, some more than six lakhs, which is a, a fifth, uh, majority of its population, came in search of land. 
they were migrants who came in search of land and occupied tribal land. And in 1960, the law was changed to recognize only individual Pattas. Tribal land, tribal laws are not recognized. And according to estimates, they lost about 40% of their land to the immigrants. Assam has a combination of many systems. There is the first of all, the Burmese system till the East India Company occupied Assam. It came under the, uh, the Assam was ruled by the Burmese emperor. So there are the Burmese laws. Then you have the Exonia, that is annual patta. You have uh, the tribal commons. According to estimate, only about one third of the land has pattas, most of it in the urban areas. About a third is Exonia patta, which is considered state property. And another third is tribal commons. And nobody knows what, where one begins and the other ends. And there is a good bit of, of uh, confusion that makes occupation of uh, the commons easy. We blame the immigrants for occupying a land in Assam. They do, but it's facilitated by the uh, confused legal system and, of course, uh, corruption through which the bureaucrat can be bribed into giving patas to the immigrants. So there is this combination that makes immigration easy. That is the overall view. Let me come to most uh, to specifics. Now, the, a major change has, has been during the last few decades has been the transition from tradition to modernity. If you see literature, only migrants are blamed for land alienation. In practice, the transition from tradition to modernity is basic to land alienation, particularly tribal land alienation, but even to non-tribal land. Now, the first is imposition of individual-based format law on the community-based customary law without preparing the community for it. And it is imposed in different ways. It's not just one law imposed overnight. There are many and sometimes devious ways of doing it. One is, for example, official schemes. You have the tea board, coffee board, rubber board, encouraging plantation of these commercial crops. These are official cream, uh, schemes which have subsidies and loans. But a condition for it is uh, the subsidies and loans are available only to the head of the family, understood as man, owning individual patta. And these are community-run uh, uh, tribes, and many of them patri matrilineal. So what happens is that land is alienated within the tribe, but to a few, from the community to a few individuals, and from women to men. So it has both a class implications of class formation and greater patriarchy. Now, uh, in uh, other places, laws are changed to exclude community land. In uh, Assam, for example, there were tribal uh, uh, blocks, and these have been either abolished, some of them abolished, others reduced, which means non-tribals can occupy that land easily. And you see, you realize that non-tribals have become the majority in many tribal areas. 
and land alienation becomes easy within that system. The third is internal, uh, internal uh, alienation, land alienation. And that has become quite strong during the last few decades. Many, I mentioned the imposition of individual based formal law through the official schemes. Those are one of the reasons. The second is the educational and health services, which are concentrated in major cities or outside the region. Very few good colleges in the hill areas. All the health uh, systems, health uh, services are uh, in Guwahati and in Shillong, very few in the rural areas. The rural health services are poor. The civil society and church groups run educational and health services in these areas, uh, but they are not uh, government funded. So the schools have to charge fees, which means the poor are excluded. And even if they were to uh, give scholarships, transport is difficult because rural transport is neglected. Transport between villages is extremely poor, which means even when these services are available, the, the people lack access to them because of poor services. So its result is that people sell their land in order to send their children to colleges in the major cities, Guwahati and Shillong, or outside the Northeast. So there is plenty of land alienation within the tribe, richer individuals buying land from, uh, in, uh, from uh, poorer persons, and a good bit of impoverishment, land alienation because of that. When it's for educational reasons, it's the best land that is sold, but there is some possibility of negotiating a price, a fairly good price. That is not the case when it's for health services. In a health emergency, the family has to sell its best land at a throwaway price to mem uh, richer members of the community. So. That again is another uh, cause of uh, land alienation and impoverishment cl and class formation. So fear of land alienation is always there. What is it caused by? We speak of immigrants. They are, they are definitely one of the causes, not the only one. Tribes live by community-based customary law, but community land is recogni not recognized except when it is in the, uh, they are ruled by in the 371A or G, tribal customary law, or in the six scheduled areas, not in the remaining areas. So in Assam, for example, at, uh, estimated third is Exonia Patta, annual Patta, which is considered state property. And a third is community land, very little, some of it under the sixth schedule, the rest outside the sixth schedule, again considered state property. The Naga and uh, Kuki, the hill tribes of Manipur, rejected the Manipur Land Reforms and Land Revenue Act 1960, which recognized only individual uh, land ownership. The hill tribes rejected it because uh, the, they felt that it will alienate their land. And when you look at Tripura, you realize it has really happened. They demand the sixth schedule because they believe that it will protect their land. The question is, does it really protect tribal land? They want, the, there is the tribal customary law, but 
it prevents tribal land alienation to outsiders, but it does not prevent internal land alienation. It does not prevent class formation and it, it is not gender friendly, does not confer equal rights on women, which is the case in most laws, but it does not prevent greater patriarchy. Now, does, will the sixth schedule prevent tribal land alienation? It's not certain. In the six scheduled areas, land comes under the autonomous district councils. And in principle, on paper, it is easy to prevent land alienation. But that is where there is also the formal customary interface. And that makes privatization and alienation easy. In the tradition, the tribal chief and his council took all decisions. The British introduced the new chief, Gaumbura, head of the village. And in some cases, an influential Gaumbura is named Chief Gaumbura. Now, what happens is that the bureaucracy, the state has a way of using this system for its own benefit. While according to the sixth schedule, all land alienation should be through negotiations with the village. In practice, the administrator treats the Gaumbura as the owner of all land and deals only with the Gaumbura. So it is easy to influence one individual in parting with that land. And later the Gaumbura or the chief shares co that compensation with different families, the amount depending on his closeness to, uh, to him. Now, in practice, though on paper, it is land alienation is difficult under the sixth schedule. In practice, because the state deals only with the head, the Gaumbura or the chief of the community, alienation becomes much easier than in the fifth schedule areas. So what is its result? The result of the Gaumbura is that power shift from the community to the individual Gaumbura and from the Gaumbura to the state. Women have some power as long as land is community owned, community managed, I mean. But with the state dealing only with the Gaumbura, women lose all decision-making power and uh, their status, uh, they lose also part of their social status, which is better than in caste society. They are not equal, but uh, their status is better than in caste society as long as they depend on community management. But that too gets weak. Then you have the Autonomous District Council. That again is an inter interface between the formal and the uh, customary. ADC is elected as such, they represent political parties. So in practice, the ADC Autonomous District Council is a wing of the state, which again means that the community lose power because the state deals with individuals and with the ADC. All these factors make alienation easy, particularly when the state wants to take over land. The Gaumbura becomes decision maker, not the community. 
then you have the whole issue of June shifting cultivation. Somehow, what is needed is modernization of that shifting cultivation, an alternative that makes it viable. But the state wants to get rid of it, discourage June, and encourage commercial crops instead. Not the commercial crops which are within the control of the tribes, but commercial crops that come from the states, such as tea, rubber, coffee. When the commercial crops are within the control of the state, they can uh, adapt jume and the rest of their cultivation to their own needs. For example, we have seen in Meghalaya among the Kasis, they have been traditionally growing crops like cabbage and uh, um, others like pineapples. What they have done is to grow them on a bigger scale together with their jume, in their jume fields, together with their jume crops. With a bigger scale, they have a greater volume, a volume of these crops, which they can sell. And they have learned uh, how far they can go from the village. So they have developed the skill of going a bit far from the village to the towns and selling them, selling the, these crops. So they have improved their income while protecting also their sustenance, subsistence uh, crops that are grown by June, which is not the case when the state introduces commercial crops. It speaks of individual ownership, loans and subsidies, and wants to get rid of June. So its result is that Many members who depend on community land become landless, class formation and greater patriarchy is its result. I do not want to give too many examples. I can give you one from the Garo Hills. The Garo are a matrilineal tribe. In the 1980s, the rubber board introduced rubber among them. We saw two, year, two decades later, we did a study. We realized that 30% of the Garo families in that, those district, districts where there was rubber planta plantation were landless. And the price of rubber was controlled from outside. Fortunately, there was a person from Kerala working among them who knew rubber Price Rubber Cooperative, she introduced uh, rubber cooperatives and then kept in touch with uh, Muatupula in Kerala where the price is fixed. Every evening she would phone there and they would fix that price for, for the following day. When they formed the cooperative, the situation improved, but that does not happen everywhere. In Tripura, for example, is the second biggest rubber growing state in the country, but the price is controlled from outside. So uh, then you have land acquisition for which they deal with individuals, but does not recognize community land, which means compensation is only to, given to individuals. So that is another area of land alienation and impoverishment. So then there is another area, the World Bank funded project to computerize records. <laughs> Computerization is needed, but you take the present ownership pattern and computerize it. That's exactly what the corporate sector wants wants to make it easy to make, make it easy to uh, take over land without encumbrances. So take, for example, the case of Assam, 
only a third as Pattas. Mostly, it's an estimate. We don't have definite records, which means once you computerize this, two thirds is state property, and the corporate sector can negotiate with the state, take over that land without taking the people, uh, people into consideration. The situation is not clear in Andhra, uh, Arunachal Pradesh and Manipur, which uh, Arunachal Pradesh is a tribal majority state. Manipur has 40% tribals, but neither of, the, of them comes under either the fifth or the sixth schedule. And custom, the customary law is not recognized. What do you do there? Land alienation to the corporate sector becomes very easy in that situation. So that is where one has to look at the causes of land alienation. The tendency today is to think of a single cause as the cause of land alienation. In practice, we have to think in terms of many causes. The first is modernization. Uh, first, there's some think of modernization as the only cause. Others think that all land alienation is, is from tribal to non-tribal. Then the co uh, most common thinking is that migrants are the, uh, particularly Bangladeshi migrants are the cause of uh, land alienation. All these exist, no, all these are true, but those are not the only causes. New causes have risen. Modernization is one of them. Development induced displacement is another. Migration is one more cause. But as I mentioned, another major cause of internal land alienation is the education, education and health facilities that are concentrated in the metropolitan major cities. Transport is highways between cities and with uh, Southeast Asia. Rural transport is neglected, particularly in the hill areas. All these prevent uh, people from gaining access to these facilities. So they have to go to the urban areas or outside the region for education, healthcare, and even when they are available within the rural areas, transport is poor. And uh, the, they find it difficult. So they lose much of the land because of it, which means that much of his, it is within the tribe. So you have the phenomenon of uh, external and internal alienation going side by side and its causes are not just the formal law the formal law the interface of the formal law and the failure of the uh, customary law to uh, to prevent internal land alienation and greater patriarchy and class formation so in other words, the change of law takes many forms. The first is, as I said earlier, reduction in the number and size of tribal blocks and belts in Assam. Assam had 35 tribal blocks and belts. Today there are 25 and they are much smaller than what they were which means they have been reduced to less than half of what they were. The second is the Land Acquisition Act made which recognized only individual ownership, made applicable where community land prevails. The third is formal the formal customary law interface. 
I've given you examples of the other two. Let me give an example of this. Or let me do that later. For official projects, putting conditions like individual land, uh, individual land and loans and subsidies to head of family, understood as man. And fifth, immigrants come in search of land both from Bihar and Bangladesh. Most of them, agricultural laborers who have agricultural, no agricultural hill, uh, skills, but do not have land, no land reforms there, so they are in a feudal system. They come in search of a fertile land, occupy it and develop it with three crops. Its result is both internal and external land alienation. So, which means, one, removing the tribal beds and blocks title turns tribal community land into common revenue land. That makes alienation easy. Non-tribals can encroach on it. Or the state can allot it to non-tribals or acquire it without compensation because it's considered state revenue land. Which also means that the tribes lose their right over, right over their ancestral land because ancestral land cannot be alienated as long as it's tribal. Even in the formal law, there are laws protecting it. You see it in the growth of non-tribal population. Arunachal, it has come down to 64%, Tripura from 59% to 31%, and so on. The second is customary formal interface. Let me give the example of the Kasi tribe in, in Kasi villages. Men who control the Dorbar, Dorbar is the village council, make use of their power in the village council to transfer community land, which comes under women. The Kasi is a, a matrilineal tribe. The, they transfer community land that is under women to their own names. So that has implications both for the community and for women. The second, which I've mentioned more than once, official body like tea, rubber, coffee board, encourage their pl pl uh, plantations with loans and subsidies to individuals, to heads of families understood as men. And uh, much of it is in matrilineal tribes. So land is taken over in matrilineal tribes. It, uh, it weakens the community and women's power. In patrilineal tribes too, a few individuals monopolize land and deprive others of their share. It's impoverishment and loss to the community. So this is internal land alienation. A few individuals monopolizing and in, uh, uh, impoverishing the rest and the customary formal interface and official policies facilitate that transition. Then again, I come back to what I said, the development paradigm. Much tribe, tribe within the, uh, tri uh, much alienation within the tribes is for college, uh, send children to colleges for healthcare or because of lack of access, because of poor rural transport. Now, even when civil society and churches open schools and dispensaries, because of poor uh, uh, rural transport, they are denied access. Straight-run schools and PHCs are of poor quality, but the poor have to use them, which means the private schools are not, do not have grants in aid, so they charge fees. They may be low, but the poor cannot attend them. 
So it confirms the poor in their poor status and trans poor transport prevents them from attending them. So the class differentiation grows further. So let me end here in order to give some time for questions. What are possible solutions? One, the choice should not be between the formal and the customary law. The tendency today is to impose the formal law and somehow sideline the customary law. The customary law is judged from the point of view of the formal law. It is important to respect the customary law but it has to be modified to respect gender and class equality. It cannot be accepted in its present form. It has to be modified, modernized. So modernizing tradition is the solution rather than imposing what is called, what is called modern on the traditional and destroying the traditional. Modernize the which means that the formal law should recognize community ownership and not just individual ownership. Then, much land has been lost and that has caused conflicts. It is next to impossible to reclaim that land without massive bloodshed. I think the civil society should come together to help the community to create a situation that helps people to develop land as a community. All the effort today in Manipur, for example, is to protect land from uh, the plains people. That is required, but that alone is not enough because they are busy, the hills and tribes, uh, plains people are busy fighting for that land. In the process, we have the two cats fighting for one cake and the monkey dividing it, eating it up. As the train, plains and tri, uh, hills people uh, fight for that land, the corporate sector takes over that land surreptitiously. If you take the Asian Highway 1 going to Myanmar, you see the amount of land that has been taken over by the corporate sector in this way. And the, uh, both the hill tribes and the uh, plains, uh, plains people have lost that land. That has to be prevented. That can be prevented by creating a situation where the people who have that limited land can develop it with free crops, crops that are within their control, and not just grow crops and leave the marketing to outside. Grow those crops, process them, and market them as a community. You grow them as individuals, but processing and marketing has to be as communities. A great amount of training is required, but those have to be crops that are within their control. In other words, agro-based industries with, controlled by the community have to be encouraged. The second solution has to be, to my thinking, private public transportship in education and healthcare. There are enough civil society and church run schools in the hill areas, in the rural areas. I don't say enough, quite a big number. They would be able to run more, but then they have to charge fees. I think it's important to have private-public partnership. 
the state should be made to pay for the salaries and maintenance of the schools. Here I am not asking for the moon. Look at the, the southern states and western states. From the early 60s, the state has been paying the teacher's salaries up to the uh, college level, undergraduate level, and even their pension, not just the salaries. Giving grants to put up buildings, or if they were put up by the management, they are paid rent to be able to, main, to, be able to maintain the uh, buildings. Now, that has worked. And that explains also why one of the reasons why the Dalits and have been able to access schools is not just the reservations, but the ability to access uh, schools and healthcare. And that is where also you have Dalit movements of the educated who are demanding their rights. There is no reason why this should not be done in the Northeast. I'm not speaking of CBSA and ICSE schools. Let the rich buy education there. I'm speaking of the schools coming under the state board. Again, the health centers, the health, uh, state health centers are not run properly. And uh, the Private, the civil society has to run them often with foreign aid and FCRA being changed continuously to create more and more problems for them. Isn't it time the state worked together with the private sector, with the civil society and church groups, combined the state system with the private system that allowed the three the civil society, church, and uh, state-funded uh, uh, state uh, centers to work together to bring real health care to the rural areas. And what the state has to do is to improve rural transport. Once the educational system and health system improves, the state has to make sure that people gain access to the, these services by improving rural transport. In other words, the development paradigm has to be questioned, has to be changed in favor of the rural areas and the poor in such a way they, that they become the beneficiary of development, not just paying the price for the development of the urban middle class and the rural upper class. It has to be inclusive development and the legal system has to, ref to reflect that system. Thank you. Here I stop. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, uh, for that uh, insightful uh, presentation and sharing uh, with us your uh, on ground knowledge and experiences. And I think we have talked about a lot of uh, issues uh, starting from the imposition of the formal laws uh, to uh, traditional uh, uh, practices and how the land alienations are happening within the communities and how the land acquisition rate actually is favoring the individual uh, individual than the community rate when we talk about the, the community uh, resources in Northeast India. And also that, uh, also like you, and to the, some of the solution, I think is very uh, uh, remarkable actually. So now I think uh, we uh, are going to open up for, for the uh, open question our sessions. And uh, I'd like to request if anyone has any direct question uh, for sir, uh, they can please uh, unmute their mics and they can also, uh, ask for the sir directly. Or otherwise, uh, if you have any question, you can also type in the chat box below and we take this question directly to the server. Uh,
Yes, sir. Uh, the first question there is, let me, shall I answer the question? Please, sir, go ahead. Please, sir, go yes. ahead. Yeah. How is uh, uh, acquisition from Drishti Bhatkiri? Uh, good after, how is acquisition uh, land for public purpose different in a six year area like Meghalaya? How has it affected the community? Actually, there in the six schedule areas, in theory, the state acquires it from the community. Under the six schedule, you are supposed to negotiate with the community, with the village. But in practice, as I said, the uh, uh, administrator negotiates only with the head of the village. So its result is that it negotiates with one. Take, uh, let me give the example of the land in the Garo Hills in Tura, taken over for the uh, Nehu campus, Northeast uh, Hill University campus in Tura. It was taken from the head and the head distributed the uh, compensation among the families. The, the state treats the head as the owner. And that is the problem. So in, in that sense, it is even worse than uh, acquisition of individual land. Uh, then you have one, the article, have I answered that question? Yeah. I, yeah, I think so, sir. Yeah. Article 21, right to life should recognize the traditional rights and not only the formal revenue rights and acts. Right to life, uh, the uh, Supreme Court has uh, interpreted it as right to every uh, right of every citizen to uh, life with dignity. So it's not just physical life, but it's more than that. And th the land law should reflect that. Uh, the LAR and R 2013 has made so a small beginning in that, but it's not enough. The whole issue of land ownership, land takeover, rehabilitation, compensation, have to be looked at from that point of view. And the tribal, the fact is that tribal land is closely linked to their identity. And identity is part of that, uh, that uh, right to life with dignity. And that has to be recognized uh, in the law. Then from Andrew sir, Helen Barra. Sir. Yeah. Sir, so that's that's not happening actually, no? That's, so that's not the, happening. That yeah, is sir. not happening. And not true. even probably Forest Rights Act also probably that's not uh, uh, the forest recognizing it. You see, to some it uh, the Forest Rights Act made a beginning uh, 2006, but somehow very few states have implemented it properly if it were to implement, there would be a beginning of that, at least in the form of ownership. And that does not apply to the, to the six schedule areas. It applies all, only to non uh, six schedule areas. And uh, very few states have implemented it. Uh, but I think the uh, for the for FRA should begin, begin, become the model for others. Then Anju Helen Barra, uh, could you please throw more lights on condition of tribal women in the Northeast? Well, there is a myth that tribal women are equal. No, they are not. But there are grades of inequality. You have in the north where the woman is the 
property of the father when his child belongs to the husband after marriage and to the son after widowhood. She is not a, an individual in herself. You have a slightly better status than that in, in some, some, some southern states. Not equality, nowhere is she equal. Then you have the community ownership part of it. Jume cultivation area, for example. Where the woman has some decision-making power in shifting, in the shifting cultivation areas. Why? Because, say, in that system, in most shifting cultivation areas, the land is the this one ownership the resource is in the hands of men production is in the hands of women unless in except in uh, uh, settled cultivation where the man owns the land the man takes decisions about the crops the man controls the division of labor so it is completely male controlled and the woman is given what is back breaking and uh, work that involves standing in wet fields and bending for a long time. In shifting cultivation, men decide, take the first decision, which is who will cultivate, uh, which plot will be cultivated during the next three years or so. Then the man of the family chooses the plot and they, the community also decides how much land will go to which family and so on. There are some de decisions. The man performs the worship for, uh, while choosing that land, asking pardon of the goddess for being forced to cut some forest goddess for being forced to fo cut some tree and praying for a good crop. At that stage, the woman takes over. The division of labor is woman friendly. It's shared in a better way than in settled agriculture. In other words, the woman has some decision-making power. I say some, not all. In the tribal areas, the woman is in also in charge of the family. The decisions in the family are taken by the woman. There is a better separation than in caste societies between the family and uh, society. In caste societies, the man in charge of the family, the man is in charge of, the, of his, his society. While in the tribal societies, particularly Jum societies, the woman looks after the family and the man is in charge of, the, of society. So let me give you an example of marriage when the boy and girl decide to get married, they go to the mother, not to the father for permission. Mother obviously consults the, her husband, that together they decide and the mother gives permission. At that stage, the father takes the decision to the village council. And once the village council accepts it, they are, they are allowed to live together as husband and wife. The formal marriage may come later when they can afford a big, a big dinner and so on. But there is a division, better division between the family and society than in caste societies. Now, what happens is that once patriarchy is imposed, individual ownership is imposed, 
the woman loses her uh, decision-making power slowly but surely. And with that, also her social status gets weaker. Great, that's its greater patriarchy. Helen, have I answered your question? I think so, sir. Is there any uh, question for the... Uh, any more questions? Yeah, please, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you have cleared all my queries. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. Is I there any questions uh, from the participant? Uh, please uh, mute your uh, unmute your mics and uh, you can ask directly to the So, uh, so I have one uh, question for you, sir. Actually, like yeah. uh, you talk about uh, uh, the how. Uh, uh, the community land in Northeast India are now uh, converting into uh, private uh, uh, land, actually. So in this scenario, where, uh, where uh, though we have a, a law that actually to protect uh, the community land from, uh, from the private ownerships, uh, what actually the community from the Northeast India can able to do in order Pardon? to protect? I, I didn't hear you properly. Can you hear me now, sir? Uh, no, can you repeat your question? Yeah, so, so my question is to you, like you talk about like how, uh, the, uh, how the community lands in Northeast India are now converted into a private uh, ownership. So uh, my question is, what can be uh, the communities uh, from the Northeast India can uh, do in order to protect those lands and not to convert it into a private uh, or the individual ownership? What are the steps that the community can undertake in order to stop those? Uh, uh, I do right. not want to go to the extreme of saying that uh, community land should not be converted at all into private ownership. We have to find a balance between the community and private ownership. Take, for example, among the Kasi, uh, some Kasi villages, where I mentioned modernization of traditional commercial crops, they have turned their June land to some extent into individual land, which they manage under the com community-based customary law. It's not a pata. So the, they st it still belongs to the community but the individual has got uh, control over it, but the individual runs it under the community law. And then they come together as a community when it comes to marketing. Every family does not go to a distant uh, to a town to sell the produce. They share the work, individual score. So that is marketing. And some such uh, method has to be found also for processing the village as a whole, and maybe even two or three, four villages together should process the produce, pineapple juice, uh, pres preservation, etc. Many of these things can be done by the community as a whole. Then marketing by the community exactly as they today take the they take the crop the produce to the town they can find ways of of uh, selling it as a community but it requires an enormous amount of uh, training and facilitation that's the challenge of the civil society today uh, thank you sir uh... Is there any other questions uh, from the participant? Or, or, yeah, there's a one a question uh, uh, in the chat box. Uh, can you like to take that? Ah, oh, yes, I see. Is policies like joint forest management diluting the community's hold over the forest land in the Northeast? Uh, joint forest management is a misnomer. Joint forest management in practice is the forest department managing and trying to get the work of the, the villagers to do the work and giving them a few benefits. 
what we need is community forest management community manages the forest together with the forest department not the forest department managing with some help from the people i think there has to be a better understanding of that uh and also that, like yeah yes yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, the, my uh, the in continuation, like uh, like you also mentioned, that uh, most of the the formal laws actually doesn't uh, recognize or favoring the the community rights. You talk about yes. the. So yes. So how do you see in this scenario the community can protect uh, themselves uh, from those uh, policies? No, it's again, it's a question of recognizing the community. and recognizing village forest traditionally they have been village forest but they have in uh, disappeared in practice we need to go back to the village forest in their new form we don't have to go back to the past the past does not have all the answers we need to modernize the past but we have to find a way of the past living with the present have i answered your question yes, yes. yeah then i think now after the fra and community forest management would help rec uh, recognize the community traditional uh, rights would help recognize the community traditional rights uh, i would say let's recognize community rights don't let's not add the traditional part because that may again would mean going back to the past only were the tradition community rights in which men as well as women have rights traditional rights only men have those rights men control the re re resource women control production i think we need need community rights not just community traditional kind community rights am i clear on that yeah. so i am piyush here uh, yes piyush yeah so my one point is that uh, yeah its rights is very important but if the community is not uh, provided any support to deliver their responsibilities to to kind of an uh, best use the rights they have whether rights only will be helpful for community you see uh the community is not to be given rights but its rights have to be recognized yes. these are two different things the state the community has its own rights and the state should recognize those rights and the civil society has a duty to help them to develop that community into a modern community that manages its economy processing and marketing together it's not as though the state gives them the rights the state should recognize those rights and the civil society should support that community by uh training through training through confidence building and uh management uh, providing uh, management and marketing skills i think that's the, the that's where different groups have different uh, roles to play so do we, don't you say government should also take a kind of a responsibilities to provide that's what the, the, the community government's responsibility is to recognize the rights and support those rights then here there is from to fes to to everyone village council gain power from the role in allocation of june lands to the community members with individualization of land parcel what the impact does it have on the village councils you see the village councils are leaders who may gain many things but the they they become 
leaders in a different way of individual families, not of the community as a whole. There is a real weakening of the community. It may be st uh, strengthening the leaders who may become richer, may, may be more powerful. But again, the state does not always recognize the village council. It brings in panchayat. It has done that in, in Arunachal Pradesh. We have to find a way of recognizing the village council in a modified form. So again, a village, the panchayat system and village council merged into one in such a way that the state recognizes it so also the community recognizes it. Yeah? Choose that. So, we have to talk about two other organizations. Yeah, I think uh, there are a uh, there few more questions in the chat box, sir. Yeah, yeah anyone? Uh, sir, I have one question. That, uh, Richard Sanil, yeah. yeah. In North East, uh, people have uh, several kind of land which they are accessing since the long time period. Like uh, they are uh, accessing the wood, accessing uh, their uh, different kind of NPFCs, accessing the, uh, the um, any other land. But this, uh, they are accessing those land, but they are unable. Uh, to see how they will go for the uh, maintaining the uh, biodiversity, conserving this area in that way. So, if as an organization, if we go for the helping to the community, how we can approach to them? Uh, well, yeah, biodiversity is preserved or developed in a different way through, again, this the type of crops they grow, new crops, and also going back to the tradition of uh, medicinal herbs and others, you know, they should take control of the biodiversity and <coughs> they should be helped in dealing with its commercialization to without destroying it. And that is another challenge <coughs> that we, the civil society, need to face. There's another question here for Richu Sanil. Can you talk about how urbanization and land alienation is happening in Northeast? What is peculiar to urbanization process in Northeast India? Can tendency to urbanization be reconciled with customary laws? There is no problem about reconciling urbanization with the customary laws. But that cust if you uh, modernize the customary laws, that is important. Urbanization in the Northeast is happening in a haphazard manner. It encroaches on land and it's not always clear from whom it is taken over. There are a few planned townships like towns like William Nagar in Meghalaya, a new town, but most towns uh, grow in a hap haphazard manner. But what is more important is that a large number of these towns are re actually administrative towns rather than development-based towns. Urbanization becomes positive when it goes together with industries and uh, commerce. Most small towns in the Northeast are mainly administrative towns, which do not add any value to the traditional value of land. Thank you, sir, for the answer. Actually, uh, is... Yes. Yes. 
Is there any more question from the participant? Uh, or, uh, I think, sir, uh, I don't think so. There is a, a more question from the participant. Uh, and I think uh, 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 we can now wrap up the sessions. Uh, and I think this session uh, give uh, uh, an insight into the, the land governance system in Northeast India. Uh, and also there are a lot of the issues that we have discussed and uh, put uh, put on uh, put and highlighted uh, that that how the community uh, from this notice center can able to manage themselves uh, with this uh, 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 let me uh, wrap up the sessions and before uh, wrap, up, wrap up the session uh, let me uh, thanks uh, dr uh, walter fandente sir uh, for his uh, time uh, and also sharing his experiences and the uh, knowledge with us uh, and we hope you will see you again in our uh, near future webinar sessions. And we also like to thank all the attendees uh, who uh, joined today uh, with us and presently hearing uh, uh, the talks and also participating in the uh, discussion sessions. Uh, the last but not the least, we would like to uh, thank uh, to our, the partner organization who uh, uh, supporting us uh, for organizing this uh, webinar sessions. Uh, uh, with this, uh, I, I have a last word. Uh, I'd like just like to uh, inform you that uh, there'll be another uh, uh, webinar session on 14, uh, uh, where uh, one of the community leader from Meghalaya is going to talk about uh, uh, the uh, the first red project in Northeast India. So I would also like to request all of you uh, also uh, to join for that webinar session as well. Uh, with this note. Uh, I'd like to uh, thanks all the participants and also the, the our, our today distinguished uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Fandini, uh, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. I think we can leave, I think. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.